Hey everybody, welcome back to 10% True. This channel is not monetized, I don't advertise on it, and there's no way for me to make money by you watching this video, which is why you don't have to sit through any adverts. If you do want to support me though, you can always buy me a coffee, there's a link in the description for that, or you can visit the 10% True website and grab one of these fantastic t-shirts. That way you look cool, I make a couple of dollars from the sale, and everyone wins. Anyway, I'll let you get back to the scheduled programming. Enjoy. Mike, welcome to 10% Truth. Thanks for joining us on the channel. My pleasure to be here. Thanks. Spike, you're um, a fantastic balance for some of the material that I've been putting out lately. And uh, I think at the back end of last year, maybe maybe through the summer of last year, I started doing a Wild Weasel series where we I told the story or, or my guest told the story in four parts of the, the Wild Weasel development from the F-105 in the Vietnam War all the way through to the F F-16 CJ. And I wrapped that up at the end of last year. Star Baby Petruca has been an active participant in that and Star Baby actually introduced me to you. So Star Baby, thanks, thanks for doing that. You know him, you've, you've worked with him, you've been in the same squadron, you've flown with him. But you're a front seater. And so all of my wild weasel guests, for the most part, um, you know, Baza I had on, he, so, you know, and, and sort of uh, Flash Barker, who was the F-16 CJ guy, those are really the only front seaters I've had on to talk about that. It's been a very EWO-centric conversation, which is understandable because it's, you know, that's the EWO's mission. However, I do want to hear about the front seat side of things from you. For the guests at home, what we're going to do is actually we're going to complete Another series I started last year we didn't complete, which was the F4G cockpit tours. So Star Baby came in last year, provided the rear cockpit tour of the F4G. And today in this video, Spike is going to introduce himself briefly, and then he's going to talk us through, using the magic of screen share, the front cockpit of the F4G at the National Museum of the Air Force at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. And then Spike will come back, hopefully, if he enjoys the experience, and he'll regale us with all his stories of flying the F4G. He's got about 2,000 hours in the F4, I think he said. Um, a few. And the various other bits of flying. 2,300 plus. Why don't you introduce yourself then, Spike? Who, who are you? What's, <clears throat> what's your Air Force career been like? Uh, well, Bruce Banishek, my call sign was Spike, which I earned in the 81st Fighter Squadron at Spangdahlem Air Base, Germany. Started off in the Air Force 1983 for pilot training, flew the OB-10 Bronco for two and a half years out of George Air Force Base, then transitioned to the F-4E initially just for training, and then immediately into the G model. My first operational squadron was at Spangdalem. Normally a three-year tour, it turned into six years. Uh, as uh, the famous book says, at best of times and worst of times. and uh, was in Desert Storm, and then a whole bunch of no-fly zone sorties afterward. Uh, total sorties over Iraq, 238. Then uh, from from on, they sent us to Nellis, finished up my F-4 time. I had, including training, nine years in the airplane. Then I flew the T-34 Charlie with the Navy on an exchange assignment for a couple of years. And then I finished up as a T-38 instructor pilot for the next almost 16 years. Nearly, well, it's called 7,950 military flying hours. Uh, over, I forget, 6,600 in fast jets. Um, uh, with my airlines, oh, I'm, I'm an airline guy too, so I've got about 14,500 total. Uh, I've flown light airplanes, military jets, airliners i haven't <clears throat> i haven't flown balloons or gliders oh well, i i did fly a glider a year ago once so balloons are the only ones i haven't missed did they not invite you back uh i can he was an old student of mine <laughs> well uh, i'm looking forward to hearing certainly about the fast jet side of that in future episodes yes sir do you want to you share screen spike and uh we'll of we'll course with uh so how would you like to do this then? Are you going to are you going to talk us through in a sense the sort of flow that you'd have had doing cockpit checks? What would you, what's your Sure, I can do that. Yeah, that would be good. Sort of a from left to right type thing is that would that be well, I'll say from the moment I get in the airplane, come up the ladder, 
and throw my helmet helmet bag on the seat. Um, and then what I'd be looking for once I get strapped in. Okay. How's Let's that? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. <clears throat> Ready? Yeah. Well, this was my home for about nine years between the E model and the G model, mostly the G. Uh, when you come with the, the crew ladder, uh, first thing you would do, besides looking at the forms and check the status of the airplane, I'd throw my helmet bag on the seat. I'd pull my helmet out and either put it over here on the canopy rail, which didn't fit very well, or you'd carefully hang it over the canopy bow. But you had to be careful because eh, there were a few guys that had it fall down. Um, the normal setup for most of the checks in the airplane started left to right. So that's what we're going to do. Let me scroll you around here. And we'll zoom in. And here we go. We're going to start way back here. This is a, it, look, it looks like a rivet. It's actually a switch. And that is the armament safety override switch. And the airplane is set up so that if you're on the ground, you should not be able to arm any weapons and launch them or drop them. But the maintenance or the uh, munitions guys <clears throat> needed to be able to override that ground squat switch for testing of the circuits. So this is a spring loaded button. If you pushed it in and held it, then they could do their wire tests out at the pylons or at the gun or whatever. But we had to know about it. And it, there were certain cases, as I recall, where if you couldn't get weapons off the airplane in combat, if you suspected that the primary armament system was shorted out due to damage to the squad switch, you try to press that button in and hold it and get rid of the bombs. This is a G suit test button. It's, um, it's really just a spring loaded and weighted valve. So when you put G on the airplane, this thing would sink down a little bit and start applying air to the G suit for you. This knob right here says oral tone control. This controlled the volume of both the AIM-9, whichever AIM-9 you were uh, selected on. And Steve, are you familiar with what they sound like? Yes, it's sort of warbling, isn't it? It sort of shriek, it grows to a shriek when it's got a- Yeah, so when you, first, when you first call it the missile, it's And then once you get locked on, it's a beep. Uh, fast direct switch, which is not uh, something for nocturnal activities, but um, there were two gyroscope systems for the airplane. Uh, we had the improved inertial navigation system called ARNI 101, or ARNI for short. And it was the primary for navigation for the attitude indicator up front. But there was a secondary one, the Anna Jabba 7, as everybody would call it, which is ANJ slash 7B, I think. Um, and it had functions as a, as a backup attitude indicator, but it also had some functions for weapons release, hearkening back more to the early days where you do a low level run in and you pull up and it would, it was stuff like that, launch lofting bombs, that type of thing. So if the, if you'd been maneuvering a lot and the gyro was starting to get a little bit off kilter when you were in straight and level flight, you could hold that switch to faster wreck and it would, uh, try to align it better. This is the ALE 40 panel, and it's got chaff burrs, chaff salvo, and basically you could select different numbers here based on what the, the lead EWO had decided was going to be the, the chaff and flare program for that mission. Um, we usually ran program chaff and flares from the back seat, and I would just operate flares. And that, the reason being is that way you wouldn't puke everything out all at once and say, oh, crap, now we've got nothing. Uh, let's see, what else we got back here? Ah, this is the intercom panel. So that's the volume. There's a primary and a backup and I think an emergency setting. Um, cold mic switch. I usually flew hot mic, some guys flew cold. Hard to see here because the lap belt buckle is in the way. But in this recessed hole here is a just a simple pin, I don't know, quarter inch in diameter that would, that would um, if it was sticking up about a quarter of an inch into the cockpit, 
it meant that the built-in steps at the bottom of the airplane were up and stowed. Have you ever seen those hanging out of the bottom of the F4? Yeah. Um, I had mine come out once. Uh, the speed limit is 400 knots with that. <clears throat> All right, here's some more controls for the ALE 40. This eyebrow light, I think, just means that it was turned on in the back seat. This was a switch I had to look up because I couldn't remember. Flares and normal. And I'm pretty sure what we did was I would put it in flares, which then meant that this button right here, every time I'd hit it, I'd get a flare. And the, the thinking being that the front seater, as he's trying to defeat what appears to be a heat shot, would be in a better position to control the timing of those flares. But if it was in normal, if I hit that button, if the back seater was in program, it would just, it'd start spewing everything out. <clears throat> this switch right here is for a strike camera. I don't think I've ever flipped it in my life because um, our airplanes didn't have the strike camera. You see it on, on some pictures of foreign countries that still operate the Phantom, such as Japan or Greece. Uh, the U.S. Air Force flew them a lot in Vietnam. It's a small protruding box underneath the fuselage near the left intake ramp. <clears throat> All right. This switch is uh, internal wing dump. So if you wanted to get rid of some weight, you you'd throw that switch outboard <clears throat> and it would empty the the fuel that was in the wing tanks, not the drop tanks, not the fuselage, just in the wings. Um, this internal wing transfer switch, I try, I'm trying to remember why we even had it. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was in the case of an imbalance of fuel or maybe from a, a fuel leak from, from battle damage. If you didn't want the fuel to transfer out of the wings, you could stop it. <clears throat> Um, internal only, uh, this switch, it's got a guarded cutout there in all tanks. It would normally be in all tanks so that when you're either hooked up to the tanker or hooked up to single point refueling on the ground, which was underneath the fuselage, um, it would fill all tanks in the correct sequence. Here's the air refueling door switch on the, on the Air Force ones. Of course, it's a, it's a door mid fuselage on top. And, you know, the Navy used the boom type, which came out of the right side of the nose. So you had three external fuel tanks as a maximum. And so they made the switch for the external fuel tanks triangular. And I can remember which way it went. I think it went outboard to get, to get the wing tanks to, to transfer to. No. I gotta remember. I think it was one way we got uh, just the center line, the other way we got all three. But I gotta give me a break. It's been twenty-seven years. <laughs> just Spike, just on um, that then. Why, why would you? Why would you want to select? If it's not a stupid question, why would you want to select all three or just the center line? So you could just um, the center line first. The the external wing tanks were more G limited. And, this, and once we got the high-performance centerline tank, which was really an F-15 tank that was modified, it was airframe limit. Mm -hmm. And so you'd, you'd probably want to empty the wing tanks first so that if you needed to jettison some tanks, you'd get rid of the G-limited ones, the crappy ones. And then if you had to, later get rid of the centerline. Okay. Uh, the tank depressurization switch would be... There were a couple of cases where if fuel didn't transfer normally, you might have to depressurize the tank to relieve some pressure on some transfer valve so that it would hopefully open. I can only think of one time where I had fuel that didn't transfer. Uh, it was one wing was full of gas, and the other wing was empty of gas, and it was noticeable in the lateral displacement of the stick, and we couldn't fix it. it uh, the tank depressurization switch was also used. Anytime you were landing with battle damage, the idea being <clears throat> if, if the airplane cracked open, you'd rather have it unpressurized than have high pressure bleed air spewing fuel everywhere to contribute to a fire. <clears throat> this right here is a lever to open and close the canopy. <clears throat> Let's come back down here. There's three switches here. The third one is covered by the, 
by the lap belt. <clears throat> and this is for the autopilot system. Uh, we got computer steering, automatic flight control system. Okay, this one, I think computer steer was if, if I had that one engaged and I turned the heading set knob on my HSI, I could turn the airplane through the autopilot. Big deal. Now, under AFCS, it would follow whatever route was programmed in the backseat in the inertial navigation system. And I can't remember what the one down here was. <clears throat> Here's your yaw dampers. Well, your, your dampers. We got yaw, roll, and pitch. And they were supposed to dampen out oscillations and overcorrections. Almost everyone has seen the, uh, the video of Project Sageburner at Holloman in 1961, where the Navy was trying to set a low altitude speed record. And the uh, airplane goes out of control and it breaks apart at 12 Gs. They died. Um, they said it was because this pitch damper was malfunctioning. But have you ever seen that video, Steve? No, no, I've never seen that. I'll have to send it to you. Okay. Um, the, the The requirement for the route, they couldn't fly any higher than 300 feet above the ground. And they did try it again. And the record, I believe, was 960 miles an hour, at never getting higher than 300 feet. Wow. Um, but he started overcorrecting. And when he hit 12 Gs, the thing came apart. So you'd always fly with those on then? Um. <clears throat> You would take off with them on to do BFM or other dog fighting. You were required to, to turn the roll switch off. And then I found later in my career, sometimes I'd forget to turn it back on. I said, this one doesn't seem to do anything at all. Um, so I usually just flips it off. Because <laughs> I also saw where there were times that this thing actually fought me in just regular maneuvering. I said, yeah, I'll just shut it off. Of them all, I would say the most important was the yaw damper. <clears throat> the, uh, the airplane did have a lot of adverse yaw, if you know what that is. Yeah. And the aileron rudder interconnect and yaw damper were coordinated. And it didn't completely solve the yaw issue. You had to use your feet to properly coordinate the airplane in flight. <clears throat> but I, in my view, this was the important one. But the books all said this was the important one. Hmm. You make the call. Here is the uh, the VOR control panel. That's self-explanatory. And now I'm going to try to move this picture of you and me so I can go over the throttles. <clears throat> I'm going to start out by saying I absolutely hated the throttles in the F4 compared to the way they worked in a T-38. In the T-38... You'd push the throttles up to mill stop and there was a cam and roller arrangement so that if you pushed harder, you went over the hump and now you're in the AB range. In the F4, they decided no, to go to burner, you push to mill, then you have to push both throttles outboard and now forward. And that symbol is still used as a visual signal between airplanes today to mean go to afterburner. I think the F-16 still uses that. The problem was after 15 or more years of guys jamming the throttles into the stop and now trying to get it to go into burner, well, they've jammed a dent into the stop. And I can, I can still tell you that it was tail number 237. Whenever I would try to go into burner in a dogfight, one throttle would go. The other one would be stuck. Now I'm now I'm heads down trying to pull that throttle back a little bit to push it outboard so I can get it in a burn. By then I've been shot. So that part I did not like. <clears throat> um, the F4 was famous for poor ergonomics in the early models, and all, by the time I flew it, they all had something called the five five six modification. Five five six mod. So what did that add? <clears throat> uh, I think it added this button, but this is a boresight button. So if I squeeze that with my left index finger, it would cage the radar to straight ahead and a short range scope. And then outboard of the throttle where you can't really see it was a three position switch in the horizontal, but it could also be pulled up in the middle. 
And so that pinky switch, as it was called, because you use that finger, um, all the way forward was radar missile. The middle position was heat. And the aft position was gun. So it was, okay, you want to shoot the furthest forward, you push the switch forward. Get, get the idea? If you were in AIM-9 <clears throat> and you had a missile that sounded like it was bad, it had a bad tone, you'd pull up on the switch <clears throat> and it would step to the next AIM-9. I uh, already went over that this is the uh, flares and or chaffin flares. This is a speed brake switch, forward is closed, aft is open. Underneath that, this little corrugated looking switch is the microphone. Push forward, it's mic. Let go, it's spring-loaded to the middle and it's off. Pull backwards spring-loaded. If you had the intercom set up in cold mic, you could talk to the back seater. Now, one of the problems I saw was guys that had just come from the T-38 back in those days, the switches were reversed. In the T-38, the top one was a microphone, the bottom one was a speed brake. So you check a guy down the radio and you look over and the speed brakes are sticking out because he was talking on the speed brake. Or he's, he's desperately trying to stop an overshoot with too much closure and he starts keying the mic and you can hear him go, fuck, holy shit, we're going fast. So that was always funny. This flat looking plate thing here, and there's another one that's got the, uh, the chaff and flare dispenser on it. These are the finger lifts. And so once you've started the engines, you'd come over a small hump and those things would click into place so that when you pulled the throttles back to idle rapidly, you wouldn't be able to accidentally shut off the engines. Behind the, the, the throttle and lower where you can't see it is another similar looking button. I don't, know, I don't know if they're black or red, but those are the start buttons. So you get the, you tell the crew chief air on. Well, you tell air on and just start spinning up. I forget what RPM, I think it's six. You'd hit the start button on the back. When you get the 10%, you push it over the hump, you check for fuel flow and then you get a light off. All right. Oh, this corrugated thing right here, there was a throttle friction adjustment lever. And we can't see it because the uh, finger lift is in the way, but you could push the thing forward and they would get super tight. Um, I don't know anybody that ever had it in anything other than fully aft. That's a throwback to it. Uh, might be, might be. Rudder trim switch is self-explanatory. Now these engine master switches, um, you turn them on and it, it would open a master fuel valve and it would make energy available to these start buttons and some other things. So funny self-deprecating story. It was pretty standard after you landed to shut down the, I'm pretty sure it was the right engine. And and then shut off the master switch too. And you taxi back on one engine because now the airplane's light. It'll taxi just fine on one engine. So it saved a little fuel, it saved a little engine wear, it saved a little brakes. Well, I'd been flying the airplane in a little over a year. We were in Zaragoza, Spain. I was supposed to do my, fl my first flight lead upgrade ride the next day. And I shut off the right, I shut off the right throttle, but I did it by feel and I missed and I shut off the left master switch. And so suddenly boom. we had to do the, uh, the ride of shame and get towed back to the chocks. <laughs> I thought I wasn't going to get to do my first slug ride the next day, but I did. All right. Central air data computer. And I got to admit, I don't remember ever doing anything with this. Uh, it's got a reset correction and a correction off. So I think normally it just sat in the middle position and I don't think I ever messed with it. Uh, this engine start switch is for cartridge starts. Have you ever seen cartridge start stuff? Mm. You know, they got these gigantic shotgun shells that they'd stick down underneath the engine and you'd push it, bang, it would fire. And in theory, it would get the thing spinning fast enough that you could get it to start. The problem is if it's a weak cart, or if you were slow to get the thing over the hump, the cartridge might start running out of steam right about the time the engine lights off, which means 
it's going to over temp and you're going to have to abort the start date anyway. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Ah, back here, this is really hard to tell. This is actually a red lens, and that's the eject light. This is a switch and a light. You can kind of see the yellow and, and black striping around it. <clears throat> so the idea was that if you were in combat and you'd lost the intercom, you wanted to tell the backseater to get out of the airplane, you'd press that thing, and that light would light up in my cockpit and it would light up in his. I can't remember. I think we used to say when the light went out again, that was time to punch. When we were going over the air refueling stuff earlier, <clears throat> here is upper and lower comm antenna. We normally ran the thing in upper, and as I recall, it, it had some kind of signal sensor. It was supposed to alternate between whichever antenna it was sensing the strongest signals were coming from. So the idea being, if you're at high altitude, the antenna on the bottom of the, of the nose gear door would, would sense that. In my view, it, if it had a sensing system, it didn't work. But I would lead a four ship to the tanker. We'd all get our gas. And I'd try to check the flight in to the next frequency. And I'd say, uh, weasel, weasel push six. Weasel check. Three. Where, is it? Where in the hell's everyone else? So I go back to the old freak. I'm pissed off. Weasel push six. Go back to the new one. Weasel check. Two, three, where's four? And then I, after a while I got the idea, I'd ask the back here, said, hey, look in your mirror. Do we still have an upper UHF antenna? He says, oh fuck, it's gone. <laughs> yeah, the boomer had knocked it off because it was only about two feet away from the refueling door. So I learned to use this switch quite, well, I won't say frequently, um, but that's what it was there for. Uh, this switch outboard, hard to see, is uh, engine anti-ice. And what else we got here? This is the contrast switch, black on white or white on black from Maverick. And I, this was one of the switches I had to ask a, an Evo buddy about because I couldn't remember. It seemed to me it was always in the middle position and that he worked the contrast from, from the back seat. So in the early days of Maverick, it was just a simple black and white TV camera. But then they, quote, improved it by making it infrared. What that meant was the thing that you saw from on your radar scope, because that's where the Maverick video was displayed. Most of the time, it didn't look like anything what you were seeing outside. You're, you think I'm tracking a white building in a, in a parking lot. And you look inside, you say, there's a black thing on a white background. So it could be very confusing. Anyway, he normally worked the contrast from the back, but that switch was associated with it. This is a bullpup handle, and nobody ever used bullpups after Vietnam because they weren't very effective. But it did have some functions with the Maverick. Um, I could have steered the seeker head on the Maverick if we we're using it, but again, normally he did that from the back. This is the green apple is a emergency oxygen bottle. It's built into the seat and you could use it at high altitude. If you ejected it and give yourself some oxygen, you could also use it in the airplane. If it was, if you thought the ship supply was contaminated, this I'm pretty sure is the shoulder harness lock. That'd be something I didn't use very often. Um, we had a, uh, there's a whole bunch of bitch and Betty stuff. Canopy, canopy, altitude, altitude, fire, fire. She always sounded pissy when she said fire. So that's the volume control for that. The anti-skid on and off and a warning light for it. One each standard oxygen regulator panel. We had a liquid oxygen tank uh, in the belly right behind the backseater's seat. And it would slosh around and you'd hit this oxygen test button and the gauge would, and we'd say, Five, four, three, two, one. He said, got a light. Uh, pitch trim. And I was actually asking myself, what did he set that thing at for takeoff? I'm pretty sure it was at zero. I, I was flying with a general once as, as a, an IP in the back seat. And uh, it was supposed to be an out and back from Spangdalem to Carib, Denmark and back. And we take off. 
As soon as we get airborne, he says, Spike, Spike, there's something wrong with the airplanes. What's the matter? He says, I can't control the trim. He said, check the gauge. Well, the thing was full nose up. Wow. And we tried trimming it from both cockpits. It was stuck. And I said, well, let's go back to Kara. Because there was a really cute Danish enlisted girl in base ops, and I was single. So I thought, why not? Uh, he said, no, no, I got to get back to Spain. Uh, what do we do? I said, well, the slower we go, the easier to fly. So we flew from Carib to Denmark at 230 knots, and each of us would fly for 15 minutes until our arm got tired, <laughs> and then we'd swap. <laughs> okay, we got taxi light, landing light. This is the, uh, the panic button, this uh, button inside this protective cylinder. So if you needed to get rid of weight in a hurry, you know, you lose an engine or something or MIGs, whatever, press that button and anything that would drop off the airplane, so that's bombs, fuel tanks, it would jettison them. But it wouldn't get rid of anything that fired forward. ARI is aileron rudder interconnect. So that circuit breaker was required for that, uh, the rudder to be moved in the direction the stick was moving. We got two boost pumps here. You can't see one, obviously the gear handle. And the third gear indicator is there underneath the uh, canopy rail. Spike, what's the, the boost pump? Uh, yes, for? sir. What, what is the boost pump for? It's boosting fuel pressure. Oh, it, it's. So the, the main fuel pumps are engine driven and they're probably in the two or 3000 PSI range because it has to force the fuel through those tiny little uh, fuel injection nozzles into a, an atomized mist to properly burn. These were in the, oh, what was it? 30 or 40 PSI range. It's just enough to get the fuel from the fuel tanks to the main pump. So the main pumps don't cavitate. Because, you know, cap data is. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's say you tried to get out of the airplane and let's say you tried to eject and the seat didn't go. So then you tried to open the canopy with this lever and that didn't go. And then on the other side of the cockpit is a manual unlock lever. Well, if that didn't work, you still wanted to get out, you could pull this thing and it, it was supposed to blow the canopy off. So it just rapidly open it using an explosive gas cartridge. That's a defog tube. Let's go up and around the canopy bow here. The chute lights were added on, I think, well, long before I was flying the airplane, but they wanted the airplane to be able to shoot down a high and fast flyer um, beyond the ability of the airplane to fly straight and level. Um, so they had some pull-up lights to tell a guy when to pull up and shoot. But if um, on the radar for the AIM-7, there was an allowable steering error circle. So once you were locked to a guy, you wanted the dot in the dot in the hole, and that meant you were in the heart of the envelope for shooting. Well, let's say that you're, you're padlocked outside and not looking, you might see these lights flash, and that meant you were within all the parameters for an ideal shot. But I can't think of a single case where I ever used those in training to, to cue me. All right. Let's see. Most of the other stuff on the canopy bow got moved because this is a single piece. All right. Let's go back over here. So this is one of a few airplanes with a single piece windscreen. What's missing are the front canopy frames. It's not, it's not a three piece thing. <clears throat> the good parts of it, it was designed to withstand, I believe a four pound bird at 400 knots. Whereas the original windscreen was only good for, I think a one pound bird at gear speed, which is 240. Uh, it made visibility straight ahead a lot better, but in my view, it made visibility at 10 o'clock and two o'clock a lot worse. But we, and we had two of them at Nellis and that's the only place I ever flew. I remember one was tail 265, I can't remember the other. All right, now the front panel. This is an, a, an angle of attack indexer light. It used to have two, one on each side, but one was enough. 
And if you were at the ideal angle of attack for your landing approach, you would get a green circle here. We call it the green donut. If you were pulling too much AOA, it'd give you a red chevron. And if you were, if you could, if you needed more AOA, in other words, for speed, that would mean slow down, you'd get this amber one. But it was also used <clears throat> for air-to-air -air maneuvering. But even better, it had a tone system. Now, I'll talk about the tone system when I come down here to the gauge itself. Uh, the Phantom still used wet film, and that is the film pack right there. Steve, you see this little lock and load button here? I do, yeah. This cartridge was made of cast aluminum, held eight millimeter film, and the, the metal cartridge itself probably weighed a pound, maybe a pound and a half. This is the, um, that's the lens for the camera. I can tell you that in a, in an aggressive BFM fight, if this thing is not quite locked in, you may find a very, and let's say you're pulling four Gs, well, you may find not a pound and a half, but a six pound weight suddenly located on your crotch. It's not much fun. <clears throat> All right, this, it, um, this was a red, woohoo, cutting edge LED display for the uh, improved uh, navigation system for Arnie 101. And this multi-position switch, okay, I see lamp and steer point ETA. That's what I used most of the time. So the top line would say, we're going to steer point six, let's say. And then underneath it would say what time you were gonna get there. And I'd look at my map that we've grease penciled what times we're supposed to be there. And then I just adjust speed until the time of the next point matches what I want at the next point, or maybe time at the target. Uh, this position estimated time and route to the next steer point and ground speed. Cross track error. I, I never use these last two positions. No idea. All right. <clears throat> Um, a lot of the stuff that used to be mounted up on the canopy bow got mounted down here with this single piece. I'll do the easy stuff first. These are the air refueling uh, tank lights. Each one says full, so left wing, right wing, and center line tank. <clears throat> and as they filled up, a little green light would come on to tell you so. Let's see. I just got a ready light. That's for air refueling. I think door, I can't remember. These, these three though were for, um, for air refueling. The ready light basically meant that the door was up and ready to, to uh, receive the boom. <clears throat> the narrow ASB, I can't even read what that says. Is that this, is that disconnect? might be um these two are, are shrike related which we didn't use all that much <clears throat> this in range and hold altitude those two uh, enunciators are for that snap up fly up attack thing i was talking about the whole idea was to get as high as you could go go fast as you go and then the thing would tell you when to pull up so you get an aim seven shot on a guy that's ten thousand feet above you um so Scale and uh, reticle intensity. So this is basically the the brightness of the scale. If I remember where, this is the one I use the most. I'll have to defer on that one. Uh, oh, there's the shutter knob. You see this little thing back here? Um, you know, this isn't really a HUD, even though they called it that. But the projection came from down in here well below the glass it had a dust shutter and you'd turn that lever and clunk um, a plate would close to try to keep dust out of the illuminating bulb this is the brightness for again i take it back this is the reticle brightness and this is the radar brightness now i'm getting it 
Missing from this particular airplane, there should be a couple of polarized rings that were held in place by this clip and I think one or two others up here. <clears throat> and you could rotate these two rings to change the brightness and the contrast of the scope display. This is a mill setting. If you were manually setting uh, the site for dropping bombs, um, our airplanes were modified and they had a CCIP site. It was not as easy to use as an F-16 where it has a bomb fall line. Ours, the site just danced around. And frankly, when we first got it, I found it easier to drop manual bombs than to chase that site because I could never figure out how to make the thing stand still. All right, this turned the, uh, the, the site on and off. So standby. <clears throat> um, I think we put in standby before taxiing because it had a gyro involved with it. Go to cage and it just put the reticle smack dab in the middle. Air to ground, <clears throat> it would either go to the manual setting that you put here, <clears throat> excuse me, or it would be driven by CCIP if that's what he had selected in the back. Air to air, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, was the same as standby and cage. It was at 35 mils. Uh, target designate, that was a, I think that was the green cross. The weasels had an additional thing that displayed up here besides the red reticle. We had a green cross that was supposed to point at whatever emitter the backseater had designated on the APR 47. Um, we practiced it a little, but I don't think it would was ever really used in combat. And this is bit one and bit two. There were some tests that were associated with that, but I don't remember anymore. <clears throat> All right, APR 47 scope, it's got a little sun protector on there. Why? I don't know because it's not in the sun anymore in the desert and there's you're not gonna see anything classified on it unpowered in the museum. Oh, I should point out too <clears throat> that this, any weasel worth his salt would call foul on the museum because this should be set at 69 mils. It was just a thing. Well, let them know. <laughs> um, so my scope was essentially the same as the back seaters, except one fourth the size. So the resolution, not as good, but the same basic plan information was there. Now he had far more controls for analysis and then deciding which, he had the only controls to decide which signal we were gonna attack. But if, if I say, hey, designate that SA-3 that's right here, and he puts the little cursor on it, boonk, it would show the range and it would show the bearing. And if I had the harm called up, it would show a footprint of where the missile could kinematically reach. And if he was inside that footprint, if we were satisfied with the results, we'd say, target handoff, let her rip. And he would, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So, so you'd actually get a WES, but displayed on the raw? Uh, not not their WES, my WES. Your, your WES, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go left to right up here. Believe it or not, in the 556 mod, when this little group of lights was officially called the HUD because it allowed a guy to, this panel down here was a freaking nightmare in the earlier model airplanes. And because now he knew if he was in radar, heat or guns, and this told him whether or not the master arm switch was on, he didn't have to look down here and fiddle fart around with it to try to figure it out. So that's what these reflected. <clears throat> this empty bracket right here is where the eight day clock is supposed to go. Now, why the hell they can't put a damn clock back in the airplane in the museum? Really? Really? Now, I will say that apparently they were highly pilfered items because when I took tail number 232 to the boneyard on the last day in the Air Force, before I even got out of the cockpit, the guy at Davis Monthan was taking the clock out. No. Yeah. I said, are you kidding me? All right. 
we've got uh, instrument intensity light right here. This radar altimeter, I don't think I ever saw one like that. All right, the ones that we normally flew with, it almost looked more like an airspeed indicator. It had a little white uh, set for the altitude that you wanted, just, but it, I don't remember having a digital display at all. We might have had one jet like this, but this is unusual. Um, nose tail fuse selector switch, self-explanatory for bombs. Here's your airspeed indicator. You've got uh, left wing stations, right wing stations, center line gun. We still had the gun button because all the G models were just converted E models. You'd push those in and the station would light up as green, I think there. And then when you turn the master arm on, you also got an arm light in there too. <clears throat> This is also a foul. This is a G model. He's got it set in AGM-12 bullpup. <clears throat> no G model ever carried a bullpup. It, it should have been in one place, right there. Anti-radiation missile, if you're gonna have anything else on. Um, for this selector, oh, that's where I got CCIP right there. Uh, there's direct, there's blind bombing where you could bomb based on coordinates that were in the INS. Um, dive toss. There's a famous story from the seventies about let's get serious about dive toss. I'll have to send you the article sometime. Uh, rockets. I don't know what G is and nuclear push to jet. So apparently for guys that did nuke, that was the only way to jettison the bomb. This is an intervalometer for quantity and how much time between bombs you'd want if you were just dropping bombs directly. And this is another foul because we said, everyone that we took to the boneyard was set at 0 0.069 milliseconds for the intervalometer. This is a selective jettison. So you'd rotate this knob to, you could select, this is for AIM-7s. Uh, you could also jettison uh, wing stores selectively. You'd have to turn the knob to the station you wanted, select that station, Press the button. This is a foul because continuous illuminator wave, we should normally be off because if you put power on the airplane, this thing's gonna start to radiate. So this should be off. But interlocks, we normally flew in, which meant that if you tried to shoot an AIM-7, it would only come off the airplane if the dot was inside the circle and you were within range and the target maneuvering was not exceeding what the missile could cut. Does that make sense? Now, you could go interlocks out if you're desperate to get an AIM-7 to come off the airplane, but normally we flew this in. These are the, let's see. That's, God damn. I think this one lit up just to show that you had a centerline tank, and the reason it's here was because if, if you had a centerline tank, you couldn't shoot, I think it was the forward two AIM sevens. You'd have to jettison the tank. Uh, these are the AIM nines that showed them as you'd step through. And these were the AIM sevens and you'd get a ready light. So what we would normally do on a combat sortie is you'd take off, you'd turn a continuous illuminator on, the missile would listen to that signal and tune itself to it, and you'd get a ready light. And then you'd put the switch down in standby, which meant that later, if you needed to shoot another airplane, you'd turn the switch on. It's basically like a flashlight of radar energy. And now the missile says, I'm looking for a reflection at that frequency. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, this is the angle attack gauge. So we're going to, it's coupled with the angle of attack indexer lights. And what was it? 19.2 units or something like that for final approach. <clears throat> and the slats, I, I can't remember the exact AOA there either. Let's say it was, they, they came out at 11 and they retracted at nine. 
But if you were in a dog fight and you were heads outside of the fight, they put a, a, an ingenious tone system in the airplane and it told you what your angle of attack was. So you didn't even have to look. You, and, and usually I flew the, the landing pattern just listening to the tones. So the tone came on at, I, th I think, 15 units. And it would start off like this as the angle of attack increase. It'd go do, 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 do. So when you got on the optimum AOA right here, you got the green donut up here, you got a steady tone. So it started slow beeps, beep, 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 beep. And that's where you wanted to be. Whether it was your optimum turn in a dogfight for maintaining energy. Doesn't mean it's the tightest turn, but it's energy maintaining, best L over D, uh, or the, the optimum angle attack for landing. But if you went beyond that, the, t the pitch went up and it started doing that rap more rapidly beeping thing. So I'll do it again. And then you get a pedal shaker on the right pedal. Um, they didn't put a stick shaker in because it was too awkward. But that meant you were stalling if you hadn't figured it out by then. Anyway, the tone system was awesome. Where's, where's the where's the volume for that? Can you turn it up and turn it off if you want to? Um, you couldn't completely turn it off. It was part of the. It was it was tied in with the AIM nine volume back here. Okay. All right. <clears throat> One of the one of the limiting factors on the F4 when they put in the Arnie, we couldn't well, you could align the thing on external power before start, but they didn't put a proper damper for transferring power from external to the ship's generators. And if you tried it, it always failed and dumped. And here's the problem. It took 15 minutes or 14 or 15 minutes to align the INS, and you had to do that with engines running, with both engines running. Because wow. if you did it with one, when the second one came online, pfft, it crapped the bed. So we'd be sitting there waiting, waiting, waiting. He says, I said, how's it going? He says, I got a steady. Okay, steady was the first stage. And I took about 10 minutes. I said, come on, come on, come on. And eventually he said, I got a flasher. A flasher meant the little green light in the back seat would start to blink. He'd say, prime sync. And then he did something in the back, and I was supposed to take the switch from standby and put it in primary. The HSI would, uh, on the ADI, would spin a little bit, and then we were ready to go. Um, I loved the attitude indicator on the F4 because not only did it show pitch and bank, but as you can see here, it actually was a sphere and it turned in the horizontal. So, I mean, I could look at heading down here, I didn't have to. It was all up right there. Loved the thing. But maintenance hated it because it was a nightmare to maintain. Uh, what else? All right. You got your pretty much standard drum and pointer type altimeter. The standby flag means that the central or data computer is not engaged. You turn this thing a little to the left to uh, engage it. <clears throat> In the original movie Top Gun, when Cougar is all worried about getting back on the boat. The standby flag is clearly in view, which means he was sitting on the ground. <laughs> um, normally, if you were sitting on the chocks on the ground, you'd have the standby attitude, or attitude indicator caged. So that's bizarre. Here is the sources of navigation data I could have on the HSI. So, VOR attack in, tack in, ADF. We could actually do ADF on a UHF station. So if somebody, I mean, we actually tried doing this once on a SAR exercise. Somebody on the ground keying a mic for, for 10 seconds, and we had a bearing pointer that would spin around. And in theory, it would have pointed at him, but it wasn't that accurate. But almost always, we were in NAV and NAV so that um, – the INS system in the back seat was driving all this information. Unless we were flying an instrument approach, and then I'd put it in. So what's the difference spike between the left and the right knob then? One is what's being displayed to you, and one is the source? Um, yeah, I, I see. Varying distance and mode. Uh, varying distance 
the left knob, it, I am pretty sure, are these two windows, and this is here. Okay. All right, now down to the center. So the the pickle button bombs and air to ground munitions. This is different than F-16. In F-16, it, it does the trigger on the other side of the of the stick on F-16 does just the gun. On the F-4, it did any air-to-air -air weapon. So AIM-7s, AIM-9s, and the gun. This was anything air to ground. Trim button. Air refueling release button. So when you were ready to disconnect from the tank, you'd press that. But it also had some functions with Maverick. You'd press that button down, and I, if I move that bullpup handle over here, I could steer the seeker head on the Maverick with uh, with the bullpup, but usually I let him do that. This red button on the back of the stick is for nose wheel steering. And I didn't know this until just a couple of weeks ago. Um, this type of stick is called a B8, but there's another designation. I think it was EB2. It looks identical to me. But most of the jets that have this looking stick, and there's a ton of them. I mean, it's been around since, uh, I think, the F-86D. Um, it has a little flashing that sticks out here to rest your hand on, and it's been removed from the F-4, and I had no idea. I didn't even realize it until I read that somewhere. And allegedly, it was because they were afraid that if when you punched out, you'd catch your right knee on the thing and rip yourself up. I said, huh. Now this goofy box down here, and you can't really tell it's a box, but it is. It's it's the same width as a stick, but it's probably three and a half inches, maybe four inches forward, and I don't know, eight or ten inches tall. In order to meet some kind of speed stability criteria that the Navy wanted. In other words, if you're off airspeed five knots, they wanted to have a certain stick force required to fix it. Well, the only way they could do it was by putting this stick force transducer in there. Well, of course, this was back in the late 50s. They didn't really have piezoelectric uh, crystals that, that could sense pressure then. So this thing contains a series of springs and switches. And you can literally move the stick a little bit on top of this box. And I can tell you, it made it fly like crap. <laughs> because it, it made the airplane fly so goofy. And one day, just for fun, I grabbed it down at that box and flew it that way. I said, well, shit, now it flies just the way it's on. Oh, damn, baby. God, I hate those guys. <laughs> anyway, it, it really did make it. So it met the requirement for the Navy for landing on the boat. But it, it gave it some bizarre characteristics, such as if you were doing a loop, any kind of high G pull up. Initially, other airplanes, you pull back on a stick and you hold a, a certain stick force and you gradually release it as the speed bleeds up. You'd pull back in the F4 and you never knew what was going to happen next. You might have to maintain the stick force. You might have to release a little. Sometimes you might find yourself pushing forward to hold five Gs. It was bizarre. It was like standing on top of a basketball. But... Once you learn to master this thing, you can fly about anything. Was that the same? I appreciate you went through the F4E for, as part of FTU to get to the F4G, but was it the right. same for all models of, of F4? Yep. Well, I only flew the E and the G. I would assume that the C and D models were the same, but I never flew the hard wing. All right. Uh, oh, on the front of this box, and, and Extending up to about here, there's a long paddle blade called the paddle switch. And so if you put the airplane out of control, they wanted you to hit that paddle switch. The backseater had a small one, so to speak. Um, but what it did, it kicked off the yaw dampers and the autopilot if they were engaged. Because if you're out of control, they didn't want those systems putting in erroneous inputs that it didn't need. Uh, down here, these are the leg garters, and one went above your knee, and the other one went ar around your ankle. And the whole idea was if you if you pull the ejection handle, and it's not a button, 
The primary handle was is underneath this goofy logo thing they put in all the virtual cockpit stuff at the museum, but it's a rubberized cable, yellow and black. Um, when you pulled that, these garters were attached under the seat through a cable system and whoop, it would pull your legs back against the seat so that you wouldn't leave them under the panel when you ejected. And it kept them pinned to the seat when you went out so that if you went out at high speed, uh, you wouldn't get your legs dislocated or torn off your body. Because you can get, as the Dash 1 would say, you can get severe flail injuries above 450 knots. That doesn't sound very pleasant. Anyway, so that's what those things are for. Uh, this is a radar TV switch. And so normally if the switch was in radar and that meant that my scope displayed the radar. But if we were carrying a Maverick, you'd put it in TV and then the Maverick display was shown on the radar scope. Uh, destination, there's A, B, and I think it says keyboard. So normally it was in the, the bottom position and the nav data driven by the INS system came from the back seat. But he could program two destinations, A and B. And the idea was, all right, let's say we're going to go to the tanker halfway through this mission. He could put the tanker track in A. Or what if we uh, need a divert option because weather might be iffy. He could put that in B. And that way, if he took a 37 millimeter round through his head and I said, hey, star baby, you there? Nothing. No oh, shit. All right, I'll put it in B. We'll go find a hospital someplace. That's that's the purpose of that. Course track, course uh, selectors. If it was in HSI, I had control of these two knobs. And if it was down in the bottom, he could set up all the steering. Uh, G meter, um, this AGM 78 switch never used because we weren't carrying 78s by the time I flew the airplane. Target missile reject and band switch and auto clear. These are switches from its early E model days carrying shrikes. So this was, I never used any of these. Those were Vietnam eras for uh, selecting different shrikes when they were trying to do the weasel mission. Uh, let's see, we got here, we got that oil pressure, pneumatics, uh, the canopies were opened and closed with a pneumatic tank that was driven by a pneumatic pump. And uh, the gear could be blown down with that too. I can't remember what this one is, but the hydraulic pressure is, um, oh, okay. Wait. We had utility hydraulic and we had A and, and uh, PC1 and PC2, and they put two needles in one gauge to save space and add confusion. There's a story about an Egyptian airplane sometime. They hooked him up backward. They did what? Uh, the left needle was hooked to the right engine and the right engine. <laughs> And I had a hydraulic failure with the thing, and I thought the other engine was the one that was fault. So we got fired over. He, what's that? This was an Egyptian F4. Yeah, we were ferrying it back to the states for maintenance because <laughs> they they weren't uh, air refueling qualified. Uh, fire warning lights here. Master caution. So if the master caution lit up, it just meant something down here on the main warning panel was lit up. Fire test button. This is the newer style digital fuel gauge, but it was no more accurate than the older mechanical one we had. It was a really bizarre gauge. It had an art sector over the top and then a thing that told the total that you had on board, but not what was in the external tanks, no probes there. And so when you do an ops check, it's, you'd read the number of the top arc over the bottom. So you'd say, ah, one's uh, six over 10. And then the wingman gives his. So fuel flow gauges, RPM gauges, the, the ones digits are the little insets inside for more accuracy. Um, exhaust temperature, nozzle position. 
KY58 is it was a secure voice mode that I never saw work. Um, green light meant power was on and yellow meant it was engaged. The one time we tried to use it in, in the war, um, three of the airplanes had KY58 and one of them had a KY28 and they're not compatible. And it turned out that the message that AWACS was so concerned about, said, really, you wanted to go secure to tell us that. Thank you. They wanted to tell us that there were SAMs in the area. Yeah, that's a job. <laughs> we, we know. Thanks. Um, let's see. This is that manual canopy unlock lever I was talking about earlier. It's a panel and advisory light sets, post lighting for the panel, and also the warnings over here. That's the advisory. These are the generator lights, left and right, and the bus tie. That it's kind of hard to tell here, but that's the hook handle and it's shaped like a hook. Um, CNI cooling reset, and this is another one I, I was scratching my head on and I couldn't find all the data I wanted. Uh, the airplane had two air conditioning packs, and one was dedicated to electronics, specifically the radar, and the other one, the lesser important thing, which was us, because the air conditioning thing. In, the air conditioning in this airplane sucked. I mean, you'd sweat buckets in this thing. Well, anyway, apparently if the electronics overheated and it shut down the electronics, you could hit this button and it would try to reset the thing. That's the master caution reset. So if, if that uh, top warning light was on, you could put it out by pressing that button. Here's the tack and control head. Uh, these types of lights used to be pretty common in, in military aircraft called eyebrow lights. And, and uh, because if you turn them, it has kind of an iris inside. And so you can pinch it down to make it less bright at night, or you can open it up so that it's brighter. It's also a push to transfer switch. So this one's labeled COM and this one's NAV. So if this was lit up green, it, it would mean that my radio control head is the one that's being used right now. But if he, if he had another frequency set on his control head in the back, I would punch this button, book, and his would light up, and now he's got control. We could do the same thing with the tacking. Yeah. That was actually a pretty handy feature. This is the newer style radio control head, but it still worked the same box down in the guts of the airplane. So. Uh, it's like the new model year car. They changed the trim a little bit and the paint, but it's still the same thing. Uh, right here where it says fill, uh, you've, you've heard of have quick. Yeah. And the frequency hopping thing. So uh, the, the comm squadron guys could connect a connector there and squirt the airplane each day with whatever the have quick load was. Ox channel. So one of the limitations was we only had a UHF radio. Other countries opted to upgrade and add a VHF, but we only had UHF and only one that we could transmit on. But we had a secondary one that you could listen on, but you couldn't change the frequencies. I mean, you had channels, I think we had 20 aux channels, but whatever they were programmed as, that's what you had to use. So we usually pick one of them as a squadron ops frequency and we'd monitor it. Uh, oh, this silver knob right here is the canopy depressurization, well, cockpit depressurization. So anytime you landed and you're getting ready to open the lids, my uh, middle finger and index finger would go underneath this ring on the outside. My thumb would push right there in the middle, pull the thing up about, I don't know, five inches or so. All the any residual pressure would get dumped, and then it was safe to pop the lid so that it wouldn't go flying off the airplane. Cabin uh, pressure, <clears throat> pressure altitude, rain removal. Right in front of the, the base of the windscreen was a slot about this big. And if you turn that on, it took high pressure bleed air and shot it on the center windscreen and it would blow the rain off if you were landing in rain. And I gotta say, it actually worked really well. Um, you weren't supposed to use it except 
on final because it could overheat the glass. And I want to say that the single piece canopy, I want to say they deactivated it because the, the original windscreen, that center panel was made of a, a glass sandwich so it could withstand more heat. But the single piece was uh, a plastic sandwich. Pedo heat self-explanatory. I can't read what that says over there. All right, the uh, transponder control panel. Also, you've got mode one, mode three. Um, the reply light just means that the transponder is replying to some interrogation. We would do a test on the thing with that switch and this light would go on. There's mode A selector over there. In the movie, the right stuff when Chuck Yeager puts his uh, his uh, space F-104 out of control and they, they imply that the engine has quit. You see him throwing the switches forward. Yeah, he's starting the engine with the transponder. <laughs> <laughs> we need a picture with some switches. Yeah, this will work. Uh, this right here, it, we never used, and it's partially covered. Okay, this is a foul museum. This is part of the seat kit, and it's supposed to be mounted right here, upright, and it was to... to uh, is that to deploy the kit or disconnect you from it? I think it's to deploy the kit. Well, somebody's pulled it out. You should put it back in. But anyway, this panel right here is the DCU-94, and it was the nuclear control panel. And weasels didn't do nukes, so there was actually a plastic guard over these switches. And you couldn't even move them. And there was an identical one in the back seat because it took both guys pushing the same switch at the same time in order to arm the system. I had a flight commander that called it the nuclear consenting adults switch. <laughs> um, this, God, I, I don't remember what the hell that is at all. Whatever it was, we didn't use it. Uh, cockpit temperature. It's funny, the T-38 panel used to look just like this. Okay, hot and cold. This is a weird three position switch. You normally it was in auto. But you could also manually blip it over to cold or to hot, um, but it almost never worked. Now, Star Baby showed you how many circuit breakers there were in the backseat. I think there's over 200. As I recall, I had about 10. You can only see two of them here, but they're right here. Um, they're, they're a pain in the ass to see, but they're there. Um, on night sorties, when we'd first get in and we had external power, I'd throw this switch outboard. It's a white floodlights, and I'd be able to see what the hell I was doing to try to get strapped in. Warning light test switch, hold that thing outboard, and it would light up everything on the warning panel, the fire lights, and you'd also hear a bitch and Betty would go through her routine. Some more cockpit lighting stuff. Uh, this coiled cord is for the so-called Grimes light because that, that map light was made by the Grimes company. Pretty useful, except it would always, there it is, it would burn out when you needed it the most. This gigantic box, I hated. Um, this was the VTR tape recorder box, and it carried a three-quarter inch tape cassette in it, and it was gigantic. That's the button to open and close the door. The problem was, anytime you moved your right arm back too quickly, you'd clobber your elbow right here, and it wasn't much fun. I used to have a small publications bag, a pubs bag, that would fit right here. So this is behind me on my right. And one day I pulled on the runway and I said, I did a, a heading check just before I was going to release the brakes. I said, what the hell? And my heading was way off. Well, because my pubs bag, was laying on these buttons for this. This is uh, the thing that would, uh, you could adjust the heading. So I had to find, after that, I had to find a new place to store my pubs. And this, in the most brilliant piece of ergonomic engineering by the McDonald Company, the all the external lighting for the airplane, the wingtip lights, fuselage lights, all that stuff, which would be mostly important at night. And how are you going to see this damn thing <laughs> at night? Not very easy. Let's see. And that is going all the way around. Let's see. We can look 
up here. I was going to show you that. And this is pretty accurate. That's all I could see from the front cockpit. I couldn't see the. If I leaned really far forward, I could maybe see part of the wingtip. But I, in the G model, as you've seen, um, he couldn't see me at all. And um, so I was totally dependent upon him for calling out threat reactions if we were in a close range dogfight with a guy at our six. And, and at first it's chaos, but then you learn how to, to work as a team. And there you have it. Uh, there's the upper ejection handle. So for us, the primary was the one down between your legs. And that's because it will keep your arms in so that they're not ripped behind you by the airstream. I mean, it would, it would suck to successfully eject from the airplane and the seat's supposed to eventually kick you out and pop the chute on its own. But what if it doesn't? And you're plummeting to your death with two broken arms saying, damn, I wish I could pull it. I wish I could pull the rip cord. Uh, so there's the upper. Uh, let's look at the front of the thing. I think was was the upper designed for extreme negative G conditions? Was well, partially, I think, but it also has a rubberized uh, canvas curtain that was also supposed to protect your face. So I think the protect your face thing was was a good thought, but it's more likely that the airstream is going to probably pull your arms back in, in high speed. Um, this is a canopy breaker tool pinned on the left side. And let's see, you were supposed to, uh, you wanted the blade towards your face. So you'd hold it with a lot of rigid arms and bang it that way. And we always thought that was kind of a bunch of crock, but I actually saw some pictures recently of a guy doing it in a test at, uh, at Luke back when Luke was an F4 training base. And they said it took him about 10 minutes, but he chopped a hole big enough in a condemned canopy and then he crawled out. Only 10 minutes. <laughs> this is a frequency card. I don't know anybody that ever used this. Um, so it shows all the preset frequencies in the radio and who they are and what the manual frequencies are. This is the compass correction card. Another requirement from the FAA that I don't know anyone that's ever used this other than when they said, Spike, we got, we got something for you to do. What? Take a jet out to the compass rows and do a compass swing. Oh, it's like, it's got like getting all dressed up for the prom and then nothing happens. Um, and the way this thing was built, it, it could hold several different cards here. Well, on long droning sorties, sometimes you'd like to just do this. And those damn things would cut right into your arm. They're really sharp, even through the jacket. Uh, these hooks are part of the latching mechanism to keep the canopy on the jet. I think that's about it, Steve. Spike, thank you so much for taking the time to talk us through the front cockpit of the F4. My pleasure. And it, it, it's, uh, it was a good trip down memory lane for me, too. Thanks for tuning in to 10% True. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to subscribe, and if you're on YouTube, hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Thanks, and take care.